so once again, welcome to use case one, uh, which is deploying the first neural network in energy transmission service, the Elia Group TSO use case. Our presenter today is Rachel Berryman. We welcome her and we thank her for spending this time with us. Um, a quick introduction, Rachel is a data scientist at the AI Center of Excellence of the ELIA Group, which comprises the energy transmission system operator for Eastern Germany and Belgium. She's been in this field since 2017, following an MSc in sustainable development. She's going to speak to us about how the ELIA Group managed in less than half a year to deploy a neural network for predicting grid losses that saved 1% uh, cost cover in the first year in production. Over to you, Rachel. And once again, thank you for being mm -hmm. with us. Great, thanks. Um, so I will share my screen as well, just to get started right away. Can you guys let me know once um, you see everything? Yes? Yes. Great, <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, so thank you all for uh, having me. We will dive right in. Um, so the first thing we will discuss is what exactly is ALIA Group? What is a TSO? Um, what is transmission? And how does this relate basically to our changing energy system? Um, then we'll talk about kind of some specific challenges for um, doing AI within the energy space. The energy space uh, really has some kind of particular challenges. Um, then we'll talk about how we overcame those challenges and to be able to deploy this neural network in, as Chris and Fulma both mentioned, in less than half a year. Um, and then basically how we've taken this uh, past success and then been able to move it forward um, for wider use cases within the group. So the first thing is that energy is not like um, any other product in the world. It can't really be stored at scale, meaning that at every second um, demand has to perfectly match supply. Um, that's just based on the laws of physics, basically of electricity. Um, it's also not generated basically exactly where it's used. Um, so we generally have pretty long distance ways um, to get the energy from where it's generated, such as offshore wind farms, um, solar parks, etc to your house or various businesses. Um, and the ALEA group and the two TSOs that it comprises basically handle these um, long-term transmission over our given areas. So the control areas that we are responsible for, and in these areas, we're basically responsible that demand constantly equals supply um, are, as Promet mentioned, all of Belgium and then the north and east of Germany. Um, and we are responsible for about 18 million people just in the German side, um, in the 50 Hertz side and their electricity supply. Um, as some of you may know, the electricity and energy system is in, is undergoing a massive transformation in German people call this the Energiewende, um, which is the transition to renewable energy. This is necessary for stopping climate change um, and our TSOs are really right at the center of this transition. So we are moving away from things, especially in Germany, like nuclear energy, um, which has already happened. We're moving toward much more intermittent renewable energy. And we're also moving toward people basically generating energy themselves. So with their own um, solar panels or things like that, or with flexibility from their devices. And this is great for decarbonizing our world, um, helping reach Europe's climate goals. But for us, it really means that we have to totally change how we do business and how we keep the lights on. We have to increase scalability. Um, we have to increase basically our ability to manage complexity and intermittency and uncertainty. Um, one positive aspect though, is that all of these changes mean more data, but that also of course means that we need to tap into that data um, we need to be able to have better predictions, especially as things become more intermittent and uncertain. And AI is absolutely a mandatory tool for this. So that's a bit some of the challenges in the energy space and especially for us as um, a TSO. And now we'll talk about how we basically overcome these challenges with data. 
So energy problems um, tend to be even a bit more difficult than other data science problems, like some of the other use cases, for example, today, like e-commerce and things. Um, one, because some of the data is highly um, sensitive, since our core mission is really um, sustainable, or sorry, uh, reliability and making sure that everything is um, running smoothly also means, of course, that you have um, things that are fail safe and that you really have to have a lot of um, processes in place. But sometimes this makes it difficult to access data and make it available. Also, basically all energy has a time series component to it, which adds another layer of complexity as anyone who kind of works on the data science side um, in this session will likely know. Um, so these are two things that we basically tried to overcome, mainly the data access and availability to then spend more time on the other time intensive things like um, exploration and analysis, which again, with uh, the nature of energy data can take longer. Um, why it can be difficult to access energy data is basically again about kind of the, the nature of what we do, um, that it's highly important. It's very important that things don't fail. We have a lot of um, important and uh, relevant systems with different security zones and things like this. And all of those things make it difficult to actually access data and work with it. Um, so a couple of years ago, the German side TSO 50 Hertz started a process basically to streamline the process of getting people access to data. And they did this with something called the Energy Data Cloud, which basically standardized all of the permissioning, so getting access, um, as well as actually how the data is presented. So it standardized some of the APIs for accessing data from various sources. And it also meant that there was one place where it was very easy to request access to individual data sets every data set had a clear data owner listed um, and you actually only needed one permission instead of getting a separate permission for every single database. And I really don't think it can be overstated how important this was to being able to um, roll out use cases, giving people just access to um, the data that they need. So once we had this energy data cloud um, and people could get access much easier, that basically enabled very quickly some of the AI and ML development so I will talk about that in the context of um, a specific use case for forecasting something called grid losses. Um, and just quickly what grid losses are, um, whenever energy is generated and has to be transported, you don't get every single electron that was generated um, to the final destination. Some of it is lost because it's at very high voltages. Um, it's lost in the form of heat. And the amount that's lost is generally around 2% of what's generated but it can go down to about 1% if um, the energy doesn't have to travel very far or is at a lower voltage. And it can go up to five or even more percentage if it's um, traveling very, very far. And this um, range between about one and 5% is a growing and becoming more volatile as we have more and more renewables. So when you have more renewables, it basically changes this amount of loss. And um, this, being able to predict how much loss we have from grid losses is extremely important because if we don't um, have an accurate prediction ahead of time, then we have to spend money on what's called grid loss cover. Um, so to be able to keep that perfect balance between demand and supply, we have to purchase energy at the very last second, which is very expensive. And when I say very expensive, we're talking about 70 million euros in 2018. Um, and as a government regulated monopoly, this is the people's money, this is Europe's money. Um, so it's in everyone's interest, it's in society's interest to improve these forecasts. And basically that's exactly what um, the team was able to do. Once they could get access to all this data through the energy data cloud, then they were able to um, integrate a lot more data points than the forecast that they had been previously using, which basically just had um, one other forecast as the main um, feature for the model. Um, so it was very, very basic. And with the Energy Data Cloud, they were able to include a lot more data. So much more forecast data, weather data from 70 different weather stations all around Germany. Um, and then use this to actually train what was at the start, a pretty basic machine learning model. So just a very simple feed, for, feed forward neural network with just one um, hidden layer. But the real um, exciting part was that also once they had the predictions, they saw, okay, even this really pretty simple model, just because we're able to finally include all of that other data that we didn't have access to before, um, 
was doing really a lot better. And then the next part of what really made this use case work is that they were then able to deploy it extremely quickly in their department on their own. So in addition to the energy data cloud, which you see here on the left, there was another part called the Agile Apps Platform, which, which runs on OpenShift, which basically makes it extremely easy for anyone in any department um, to deploy their own app. In this case, um, the grid loss prediction neural network um, and they deployed it really quite quickly. Um, and then the predictions are then fed back into the energy data cloud so that other people can also access those predictions very easily. And so all of this again took um, from start to finish less than half a year. Um, and now once everything was deployed on this agile apps platform, um, it's very easy to update with new versions of the model. And so right away, this increased um, or improved the performance metric by 7%. Um, and again, we were able to then include a lot more inputs. And it's actually been in operation since 2019 and has really, really helped drive down the um, grid loss charges. So again, in the first year of production, it saved 1% in grid loss cover charges, which doesn't sound uh, like too much. But again, since the cost in 2018 was 70 million euros, that's 700,000 euros saved. So why did this use case really work? Um, it's really about kind of this recipe for success that then we are trying to um, replicate across future use cases. So the first one is just access to data. Um, that's really something that we found that the departments, they know their data. Um, they really are generally quite skilled, especially in such a technical field. Um, and they know what they're doing. They're able to develop their own use cases if they just are able to access the data that they need. So the energy data cloud was a huge um, help in that. The second part was this easy deployment with the OpenShift Agile app platform. The big part there is that there's very clear ownership and responsibility. So how it works is that IT is responsible for basically the app platform itself. It's responsible for having enough compute power for all the apps that are running on it. But as far as what the app itself does, that is the responsibility of the individual department and the individual de person who deployed the app. Um, so basically you can deploy whatever you want, but then you're responsible for how that thing works. Um, and this basically just makes it so much easier for departments to actually deploy because they aren't then waiting on um, another department or IT to deploy their app for them, to deploy their use case for them. They can do that on their own. So the recipe for success really boils down to kind of giving people what they need, giving people the tools that they need um, to do data science, to do the work and kind of just getting out of their way. And that's really what we are trying to now roll out wider across the company um, so following this recipe for success, we are trying to basically copy this and enable more production use cases in the group. And to do that, the group has founded the AI Center of Excellence, which is where I work. Um, and what is a Center of Excellence? It's a team, facility, or entity that provides leadership, best practices, research, support, and training for a focus area. Obviously, ours is um, AI and data science. And what do we do there? We basically help with kind of three different aspects that enable these departments of the business to um, do their own work and to, again, kind of get out of their way and just let them um, experiment and put things into production. This means working closely with HR to make sure that the people in the departments um, have access to the training that they need and the skills that they need in the future. The second part is getting people access to tools. So this could mean data through the um, energy data cloud, for example. This can mean access to coding platforms. Um, and this is really an essential part of what we do, just getting people access to the tools and data that they need. And the last part is kind of orchestrating across all of the departments, across um, strategy, innovation, HR, um, all of these kind of different departments to make sure that everyone is aligned on what the business goals are for AI within the group and um, making sure that all of these kind of different players are in alignment. Okay, so that was um, the Elia Group use case. We would love if you get in touch with us if you have any questions or even potential um, thoughts about partnerships. We have an email for our Center of Excellence. It's just artificial intelligence at aliagroup.eu. Um, there's my LinkedIn and Promix as well in case you wanna get in touch with either of us. And otherwise I will, um, Gladly open the floor for questions. 
Thank you, Rachel, for that informative talk. There are two questions here, which I will read out and then we'll open the floor for more questions. So there's a question from Laszlo Sragna who asks about your team's composition. He says, mm -hmm. what was your team's composition and where did they have the expertise to use these data and deployment platforms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so most of them are um, basically analysts, but who have a background in um, R and Python. And basically they worked kind of together with the um, IT team to learn how to deploy in the first time and then built that knowledge up within their team. Um, now though, we're kind of trying to move some of that into this AI center of excellence, um, which is really made up solely of data scientists who are then able to also yeah, help with um, sharing this expertise to wider teams as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next question is, have you later then optimized and widened this machine learning model? Yes, so there there um, have been updates basically to to the model multiple, um, where they not only changed the architecture um, of the network itself, but also added even more um, features. So on both sides, yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. There's a question from Emmanuel Blay, who asks, "How well does your model do in times of COVID and changing energy use patterns?" Uh, that's a good question. I would have to. Um, check up on that. But one thing um, kind of for this side is that with grid losses, it's really more about the generation than it is about demand. So yes, um, energy use and demand are changing in times of COVID, um, but grid loss is really related to, to generation. So it's kind of on the other side. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Participants are also more than welcome to unmute themselves and ask questions yep. at this point. All right, there's a question from mm -hmm. Rafael who asks, do you have an idea which features are most important like weather rather than smart metering? Mm -hmm. Um, that I would have to check up on as well, as far as the um, individual features, but I do know whether it was very important. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question. How do you do sanity checks on model outputs and monitor whether input, input distributions change? Mm -hmm. Another great question. Um, so yeah, sanity checks um, are definitely done because they basically this forecast is compared live every single day because it's used in, in production. So um, every single day, basically they know by how much uh, they had to spend on the grid loss cover charges, how well the model is performing. Um, so yeah, the sanity checks are there constantly. Also how the output is actually delivered, how the predictions are delivered is with um, kind of a constant graph. Um, so that's another way that kind of um, helps with sanity checks. And as far as monitoring whether um, input distribution change, yes, definitely also. Uh, yeah, hello, can I, can I post a question? Sure. Absolutely. Yes, hi, uh, this is uh, Lan Marusha. I'm uh, coming from a Slovenian DSO uh, called cool. Electrocellia. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question, uh, since you have said that uh, you mostly em uh, employ um, the, the, the people who are analysts uh, that have background in R and Python. Mm -hmm. uh, do you maybe have uh, any advice or good experiences on how to, let's say, build a proper and uh, good operational analytics team for, for uh, deploying these apps? Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, so the one thing was that this team in the um, energy economics team. So obviously they're already quite um, technical people. And then we found that, um, you know, a lot of the departments, especially working um, in energy have a lot of technical knowledge on their own. They have a lot of generally experience with coding languages like um, R and Python. So it's really just about giving people access also to further trainings, which is another thing that we are trying to do as the center of excellence. Um, so we've rolled out trainings on basically further Python trainings for people and also ones in, um, in specifically machine learning for people that already have kind of that initial um, analysis background. Does that answer your question? Yes, very much, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right, while we wait for more questions, uh, maybe a question from my side as well. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on the reasoning that led you to uh, the conclusion that machine learning would be a good problem, uh, would be a good tool to tackle this problem? Yes, that's a great question. So the big thing I think here is that they were already using a simple forecasting model. So this is pretty much just a basic um, regression problem. And so especially because they already had um, a simple model, they already knew very well what the target is. They knew very well um, because they have that kind of like domain knowledge, um, what good features could be. That I think is really why it's such a good use case for machine learning. You already have a baseline. Um, you already know kind of where that baseline's failing and where um, a lot more features could help could be helpful and which features could be helpful. So I think it was the combination of one, um, having a very clear target that they already had a forecast model for, and just knowing that they could include much more features and having that domain knowledge that really made it a good use case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have a question in the chat box. Is the energy cloud an Elia cloud or an industry cloud? Mm -hmm. So um, in general, we work kind of with both across the group. So with both um, on-prem and um, industry clouds, kind of depending on the, the use case and the sensitivity of the data. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Um, hello, I, I just ask uh, by by speaking now because yeah. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm so I'm a student in um, energy finance and um, informatic in uh, in Aachen, mm -hmm. and um, I'm wondering. Um, so your model does a um, question, you know, um, does a regression on on a simple, for, more or less simple forecast. Um, on the needs of the net, right? So that you- Sorry, um, cut out a bit. Can you repeat that? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so the model does a regression uh, by forecasting the, need, the energy needs um, of your, uh, of uh, like 50 Hertz. Yeah, it's not predicting energy needs. Um, it's predicting the actual grid losses. So what it's trying to predict is how much um, energy is lost in the transmission, basically in the trip, you could say, from where it's generated to um, basically the, the DSL level. So how do you um, lower the costs by forecasting the losses? Um, I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. Because we have to buy energy to cover these losses. That's basically our um, requirement by law. Uh, so you... Um, you fasten up the, the knowledge when you need the energy and um, you, you can buy the energy earlier for less Exactly. Uh, All yes. right, I see. Correct. And would there be um, a use case of an agent-based learning model for um, maybe like um, switching the lanes or which, which path the, uh, or maybe um, to run up some... Um, you mean to try to decrease the grid losses by like trying to yes. find basically um, generation sources that are closer? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, could be possible, but there are kind of other regulatory issues around how much we can kind of decide which generators to use. Um, and so, for example, a lot of the grid losses really come from renewables like offshore wind and things like that. And those are things that we very much want to integrate. Um, yes. even though they have higher grid losses. So there's a bit of a, um, yeah, kind of trade-off between having low um, grid losses and having high renewables. Yeah, right, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I just saw a question which looks very interesting. What are the next candidate problems to solve for the AICOE? This is a really good one. Um, basically, we really um, try that the business approaches us with, um, with use cases specifically. Um, so we also at the ELIA group have a program called The Nest, which is an in-house um, idea incubator. And there basically people from um, departments can propose a, a, um, an idea that they would like to work on 
for three months. And um, over that time, they work more or less full time on the project and then also get access to additional staffing, including people like me who work in the um, in the center of excellence. So basically, then I'm able to go work on these problems with them um, and help them you know, with expertise that they don't have in their own team. So that's really where the candidate problems come from, are directly from the various um, business areas and the various departments that really are kind of working on the ground more. Um, but some examples are in uh, system operations, for example, and then also really even down to the corporate functions like HR and finance. So we really have a very, very broad um, sector, I guess, of different candidate problems that are coming up at the moment for us. I think we have time for one last question. Um, uh, with with the, the question reads, thank you for your presentation. You said they changed the architecture of the model. Can you expand mm -hmm. on that? Yep, so one architecture change was um, expanding basically the hidden layers. That's really the main one that I can kind of expand on. Mm -hmm. Excellent, so thank you. Thank you very much for the questions, for the interaction. Um, we are done um, uh, now uh, uh, with today's meeting. Um, there is one one question which you could probably, one last question that you could quickly comment on. Is it dense or LSTM or anything else? Uh, no, so not LSTM because it's still all uh, feed forward at this stage, but yeah. Excellent, thanks. Um, so data lift number three will be live on Friday, 24 January at 11 a.m. once again. So please stay tuned and do join us for that. The, the, other, the other update from my side is a social media update, um, uh, which is if you post a picture on Twitter or LinkedIn using hashtag data lift, showing us how you've participated, you could get a Christmas gift sent to you from the AI Guild. So with that, thank you very much, Rachel, for this really interesting talk. And I also thank all the participants yes. today for joining us. It was great having you. Thank you. Thank you once again. Bye-bye.